Hey, Geekscapists, I'm here with a special treat, my good friend Patrick Reed Johnson. Um, Patrick, uh, you you know, if Geekscapists aren't familiar with you, um, I'm just going to say it like, hey, that anger, that, that Angus soundtrack was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, take, I, I, I will take credit for, I mean, there's a great, a bunch of great artists on there, but I will take, I will take credit for the Am I Wrong remix with the marching band because that was my idea. Oh, really? I, yeah, we were scouting locations in Minnesota, and um, I was just playing lots of different stuff to kind of, you know, inspire me. And as I was doing rewrites and stuff, and I heard this song, Am I Wrong, by, you know, Love Spit Love and uh, Richard Butler. And we were just pulling up to Owatonna High School in the marching band. And I kept thinking to myself, this would make an opening theme song, but what's missing? What? And I look up, and there's this marching band out on the field. And I went, <gasps> and I thought of Tusk, you know, by Fleetwood Mac. And I went, uh huh. So I called up David Russo, the composer of the soundtrack, and I said, David, if I put you on a plane and send you back to Gurney, Illinois, to Warren Township High School to re record my marching band playing along with Love Spit Loves Am I Wrong, can you do that? And so he goes, yeah. And so we called up Richard Butler and he said, yeah, you can do that. And so that's what they did. And they and then they got together in the studio. And the funny thing is, is that that song, when it first came out without the marching band, kind of went, whoop, and kind of came and went, right? Okay. When it was re-released with the marching band, it became like this hit on college radio. So, you know, I'm kind of kind of proud. <laughs> and if you watch the Tusk music video too, it takes place on a football field. Yeah, at USC, it's the USC band, yeah. and, and they're that they, you know, that it's the recording session live. I mean, no, in right, in the, yeah, yeah. That's so it, it kind of has that circular logic to it. Um, that that was one of the original videos first played on the very first day of MTV. We learned that here on Geekscape when we were doing a countdown of the videos that were played on the first day of MTV. It's sort of like a He's retrospective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, Geekscape is Patrick did uh, direct Angus. He also I first learned of him when he directed Space Invaders. Uh, he has a brand new movie out called Five Twenty Five Seventy Seven. It's available on Amazon right now for pre-order. It'll hit your inbox there. I think on November 22nd, if you yep. pre-order on Amazon, but it's going to be available in a lot of other places. Yep. I know you'll have a deal with Showtime. Um, what else is going on with this movie? How, how can people see it? And we'll talk about the movie because I, I actually loved watching it as a film geek. Um, didn't even realize I was wearing my Nostromo hat. Oh, nice. Uh, when we jumped in <laughs> here. Out, but I, now <laughs> if you Geekscape is for watching this on YouTube, I'm, I'm wearing this Nostromo hat and there's a lot of <laughs> alien and a bunch of, spielberg and lucas stuff in this movie oh, yeah. um yeah. but uh yeah and and uh why don't you talk a little bit about the movie because you started filming it in 2004 it's released now in 2022 i am not going to hold it against you i just did a, a year on the festivals with a short film i shot in 06 that i only finished in 21 so i'm not going to be like yo why didn't you finish your movie because my movie sat for 16 years so i'm yeah. not saying anything no, listen, and I'm not even embarrassed by it because it's well. First of all, there's no rule that a movie has to be done in a in a year. Although, cheers to that. Traditional, maybe, but um, and it wasn't because we didn't have anyone who liked the film. That was it was quite the opposite. The problem was um, two things. One, when we first shot the film, you have to understand that 75 percent of this movie, and you've seen it, so you know how much is in it. 75% of it was shot for a hundred and well, not even a hundred, $85,000. Wait, that, wait hold, run that back. Wait, hold on. Hold on. I wasn't ready for that number. Um, run that back at me again. How, what percentage of this movie that I just watched in the movie is, is two hours all, long. Almost everything that takes place in Wadsworth, Illinois and Lake County with the cars and the period clothes and the, the actors and all, everything was shot for about $85,000 in 2004. We were supposed to get 120,000, but we didn't get that money because the one of the original investors fell short. Which Patrick, meant if if somebody's saying period piece, we're going to be shooting the 1970s and Geekscape is the movie takes place in the 1970s. It's a bit of an autobiographical story of Patrick falling in love with cinema and wanting to, you know, the date if you're a geek, you know the date 52577 is the release of the original Star Wars. The movie's autobiographical. Uh, but anytime you, you're going to film a period piece, there's got to be another decimal. There's got to be another zero on that number, at least. Uh, 
there's definitely got to be two in this case. You just said a number that doesn't, it's mind boggling because this movie never breaks the period piece. Like, never at, at any point did I think like y'all failed in the art direction. In the so this movie is a great, great we what had, we had a great team, we had dedicated people, we had people who signed up for much less money than they're used to making because they liked the script and they liked they they believed in the movie and for they, that number it sounds like they signed up for free this is no they got paid oh they, yeah yeah they got paid everybody got paid um there were um deferrals of some amounts of money um but but they got paid and they many people on the film got elevated to new positions because we believed in them and they believed in the movie um one of the fun things is that like for the cars, for example, th that particular Venn diagram center of Lake County, Illinois is one of the biggest classic car restoration zones on the planet earth. That's cool. So there were hundreds of people that were like, Oh, my, my car can be in a movie. Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> you know, and, and, and they didn't, they didn't even care about getting paid. They just wanted to hang out. They just want to hang out with their car buddies and have their car featured in a movie. You know, that That's was awesome. Cool. And it just helped that, you know, I had a lot of good friends. I had Gary Kurtz and I had Fred Roos and I had Douglas Trumbull and I had Richard Urasic and I had John Knoll. And, you know, I mean, there are four or five shots in the movie that are just desperately good visual effect shots that no nobody even knows they are visual effect shots uh, that John Knoll at ILM did for me because we grew up together and he's... I helped him. He helped me. We were best men at each other's weddings. We've known each other since we were teenagers and he liked, he loved the movie, you know, um, we, uh, so what happened was we shot everything, but the Hollywood sequence before we ran out of money. And then suddenly we've got this movie that we've cut together that has, you know, a third of it is finished and it works. And then it goes to a big slug line that says, Pat goes to Hollywood for 30 minutes and that's it. And then the last, third of the movie which we had shot mostly yeah. um and we went around showing this version of the movie and people were like well what about hollywood and they said that's why you're here investor person you know and we eventually found a, a bunch of cool people that that said oh we'll give you seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to do hollywood we're like we'll take it <laughs> you know? yeah it's, it's multiple times what y'all did the small town indiana stuff and but it, but it allowed us to get you know austin pendleton and to get and to build ilm and to build future general and to to create these really amazing moments that are the centerpiece of the film um and luckily you know george lucas was friendly and we knew each other already and and obviously he knew gary kurtz and fred roos um and and he watched thanks to john noel running it over to the big house at Skywalker with on his laptop, he watched the significant sequences, uh, you know, and, and said, yeah, that, that looks good. Patrick can do that, you know, and gave, and then the next day I got a letter from, you know, Lucasfilm saying, yep, you've got that. It, it's all yours. He can use the behind the scenes footage that we we see it. We saw that stuff on VHS as kids, the behind the scenes stuff. And now it's in your movie yeah. and geeks gave us again, it's an autobiographical film um, about, you know, your, discovery of film that really momentous occasion in theaters as a kid you're watching 2001 as we're recording this you've got the hal uh robot behind you um <laughs> and then yeah the, the first third of the movie takes place in small town and then you got to get in the car and go out to hollywood and um you know you uh, completely worshipped um you know trumbull on this thing douglas trumbull who did the vfx and then you got into vfx once you moved to hollywood which is kind of the last third of the movie is seeing what i like that last third of the movie because it's i'm going i've just had my eyes blown wide open by hollywood you, you get to meet steven spielberg which is a great sequence in the movie and i think that casting was on another level that was fantastic and great. then you you saw star wars months before anybody else did and you came back to small town and started telling people about Star Wars and you couldn't wait to see it, but you still had to kind of finish your childhood in a sense. Right. That's and I really like that last third of the movie. That's a great way of putting it. I, I really appreciate that you said that because I'm going to use that from now. It's oh, true. It, that's exactly what it was is I had to let go of my childhood and I had to accept, and this is something that it took me years to realize about the premise of the film, the actual thesis of the film is it, it's really originally it was all, you know, Oh, poor Pat, he's all put upon and 
everything's again stacked against him. But the thing that was stacked against me was me. There's yeah. nothing really stacked against me in that little town. I mean, yeah, there are jerks that want to punch me because they can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and and I'm an easy target, you know. But that's that that's that doesn't keep you from leaving. No, you wanted to move. On. You wanted to read the next chapter without closing the first chapter, that's and that's right. a really painful thing. Is to say, I, you know, the, the things that inspired you, your childhood, your imagination, these things. Um, you there was maybe a fear of of, of shutting that down well, and moving on to the more practical form of that dream. It's the comfortable nest that you have to jump out of in order to go into undiscovered country where you can fail. I mean, the end of the movie, as you know, the last shot in the film is not a, um, it's not a confirmation of anything. In fact, it, all it is, is it could be a door. It could be a wall. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know what's going to happen to this guy. We don't, especially because I'm not particularly famous. You know what I mean? That one of the reasons I kept it in my name is that, and, and you, you'll notice that the poster doesn't have my name on it. I don't know if you've seen the poster, it's got a little, like the corners ripped off at the bottom right. where it says directed. <laughs> and the reason for that is that when that title comes up at the very end, people are like, wait, what? That yeah. guy that we just, yeah. So anyway, you know what I'm talking about, but it, that yeah. Finishing childhood was it and also finally believing what everybody else in my life knew before i knew it which was that i was out of here i was leaving and robin says it in the first third of the movie she's the first one who says i'm not gonna get with you we're not you're leaving and i'm like my character's like what are you talking about and she's already way ahead of me Right. Yeah. And all my other friends, Bill is ahead of me. My mom's ahead of me. Even my sister, who seemingly wants me to die in flames, is actually way ahead of me. Get out of here. You know, did you have that detached that did you have people detaching in your life as you were growing up in the 70s? And you you were dreaming of that thing on oh, the yeah. other side of the horizon? The, Absolutely. The... Absolutely. And, and, and by the way, it says at the beginning, most of this is true. The rest is even truer. Right. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, is that the wilder, this is not very fictionalized at all. In fact, the wilder and, and more amazing the moment, I guarantee it's the closer to moment by moment dialogue and situational accuracy. It was just collapsing three years worth of events into one and connective tissue and order of appearance. And the villain is actually a, you know, a combination of a couple of people and it's that. Oh, so you got your butt kicked multiple times. Oh, many times. Yeah. I'm sorry uh, about that. But <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, I wouldn't be hosting Geekscape if I didn't have a similar <laughs> upbringing. So I can't right. be like, oh, dude, we're, 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 we're having shared experiences here. We could both go through our PTSD together. <laughs> oh, totally. Oh, go for you know, listen, let me put it this way. What you see in the movie, um, the original screenplay, which I should probably publish at some point or put on the, the special edition Blu-ray or something, was much more Truffaut-like um, in that it, 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 my my father, the relationship with my father was much more abusive than it is. In the, yeah, now, I don't mean in any way that's un sure. unseemly, but he was a violent, angry alcoholic, and he did some things that we put in the script that when Fred Roos read it, he said, Patrick, you can shoot this, you can cut it together, you'll win an Oscar, <laughs> and no one will go see this movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, my father at one point, I had I was sick and I didn't feel like going out and feeding my pony that on a winter night and he was angry and drunk and he came in and he's like, he is that is that's me. A, it's over uh, here. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's over here. That's, that's over here in Los Angeles. You wanna, yeah, of course. Yeah. No, yeah, it's fine. There's yeah. got to be a helicopter. No, I was about to mute the mic and then it stopped. If okay. it comes back, I'll mute I just myself. I to make yeah. sure I wasn't ruining your podcast. Um, no, no, no. So, I, I, I ruined it for 16 years. We're good. <laughs> so my, my dad decided, okay. And so he went up to his room and got out his high-powered rifle case and put it together and put the scope on it and walked out the back door in the middle of a snowy night. And I'm screaming, what are you doing? What are you doing? And then I hear... <laughs> And he walks back and he goes, well, don't have to feed the pony anymore. Wow. 
And I wow. ran screaming in my bare feet and, and, and pajamas out to the pasture. And there's a bale of hay and my pony eating the bale of hay. Oh, he scared the hell out of you. Yeah. When that oh was my just, God. Was one of many things. Right. So that's, that is those, that's traumatizing as hell. Even when you confirm the pony is still alive, oh, that is yeah, traumatizing as then hell. It's like, well, is he waiting in the house with the rifle? You know, <laughs> you're second guessing every moment of your childhood at that point. And your relationship with your father is is ambiguous at best. Oh, at best. Yeah. I can see why you were ready to get the hell out of there. Yeah. Like, Patrick, that's that's really horrible. Yeah. <laughs> and we're exploring these moments in I'm not going to say revisionism in a sense to your childhood but how I mean what did that do on a deeper level to be able to do this and uh, you talked about versions of the script versus the, what we see here in the film how were you able to balance maybe some level of overindulgence well, or revisionism well I'll tell you what happened and, 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 and it's great that this movie took so long I mean, first of all, by the time we shot the film, my father actually passed away about a day or two before we started shooting. Wow. Now, you have to also understand that... And you kept your start date. Yeah, we kept our start date. We had to. Um, we A film that size, when you get collect a bunch of dedicated people and you've only got that much money, you know, yeah. uh, it, it, it was... I mean, I still got to his memorial, uh, you know, a week later, but 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 I had to... You know where had, where was had, your head at though? Well, my you're, head. You're gonna go on set and see somebody playing a father you just put in the ground. Patrick. Well, actually, none of the stuff with my father was shot until about 2015. Okay. Um, um, but what what happened was, see, you have to understand that by the time because I started writing this in 1999. Now, by the time I was a fairly whatever successful filmmaker with a deal at Universal and you know and developing Dragonheart and these other projects, my dad had sobered up. Okay. And, and he was now, you know, he had a new family, my half brother, Michael, and I, he and I were friends, everything. My, my, he was a great grandfather to my children. He, he, and he had come to terms with his behavior in those days, uh, as had I. And, and the reason I had was because he made the effort to not be that person anymore. And, and so he and I were actually quite close and in and, and really good shape by the time I showed him that script in 1999 and he, he said, look, this is difficult for me, but he goes, you're absolutely right to write this. And it's absolutely right for, for me to be the villain. And, and at that time he was a much bigger villain in the script. Right. Um, but when he died, um, a couple of things happened. One, I, I listened to Fred Roos who said, don't go so far down this path that it's that movie because that's not, the movie you're really trying to make. He said, your movie is about you surviving a lot of things, including your own doubt and your own, you know what I mean? Don't mm -hmm. make it about, you know, uh, just a conflict between you and your father, because that becomes a different film. Right. And, sure. and, and so, and once he died, I also felt like he can't, he can't defend himself and not that he would have had to, but why put that on his plate? It right? could be mean. Yeah, it could be perceived I, as. I didn't want, and that's not yeah. what I wanted. And 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 a, a lot of and it, it 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 takes a long time sometimes when you're making a film to figure out what you're really trying to do. And when I first was writing it, I think I was trying to exercise a bunch of demons and get a lot of pain out, uh, and I did. Um, but but when I was making the film, and then when it was actually time to shoot the footage of my father, which is, was played by me in the film. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. Patrick, yeah. this is all circuitous in your head. Well, like, and there's is, a lot of that. This is a this is an onion of unpeeling. Well, my, my and my second offspring, Lonnie, uh, formerly Merrick, uh, when she was you know eight, chopped off all her dark hair, dyed it blonde, and let me make her play me in that opening scene in the theater. Uh, that was insane, <laughs> and she's that that that's one of the and the cool the reason was is that her facial features so matched all my old Super Eight movies and photographs that we could just intermingle no problem. 
Sure, I I I didn't doubt any of this. No, yeah, I thought I thought those super eights it may have even been reenactments shot on super eight in the last 10, 15 years. They actually were. The Planet yeah. of the Apes stuff is all like sure. the, the little version of me is my son Cody playing Charlton Heston in a loincloth. You know, and I love that you're still making home movies. <laughs> <laughs> we shot them on super eight with my original super eight yeah. camera. I, like, I think a lot, most of this film was shot on film, not on digital. Almost correct? all of it. Yeah, was shot. almost entirely. There's, there's a bunch of stuff that we did in the last year or two that we did digitally, but but the the ninety percent of the film is is film. Uh, the, the all the things that take place in in Wadsworth, Illinois, or Lake County are super sixteen millimeter spherical one eight five, and everything that takes place in Hollywood it it expands out to two two four zero anamorphic super thirty five. Uh, which was awesome. I mean, that was really fun to do. But, um, but no, it, 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 I finally realized, I mean, there are a lot of other cameos too. I mean, uh, the guy who plays Todd, the theater manager, yeah. is the actual Bill, my best friend, Bill. That's awesome. I was wondering about him because yeah. he has a prominent part also and in the press the, materials. Yeah. And he's, he's, he's awesome in that part. I mean, he really, my, my, maybe my favorite line reading in history is when he turns away and goes <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> you know, when he's, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I yes. Say, but um, the, and, and the girl or the nurse that comes out and says, congratulations, it's a fist. Uh -huh. That's the real Robin. Wow. That's the real girl that, yeah. Yeah. And um, there's, there's a ton of talk about just because, obviously the producers on the film like you mentioned earlier gary kurtz and fred roos um they were working on all the movies you idealized like gary kurtz was obviously lucas's collaborator on the star wars films through empire you know fred roos did all the coppola movies and Sophia's like d discovered people like i mean i wouldn't say he discovered jack nicholson but those early movies like five easy pieces yep I, that's, all fred. He, that's actually fred and you know he, who he discovered really really was harrison ford Yes, because he did American Graffiti. But you, do you know the story of how he got the real story of how he got to read for Han Solo? Because it's one of the great stories of all time. So and you've heard all the other ones, all the other different I'll casting tell you possibilities of Han Solo. This is Go from for Fred's it. Mouth, okay. So Francis, okay. So Francis Coppola has bought uh, Hollywood Sunset Studios or whatever, uh, and and had turned it into Zoetrope, right? Yes. So you got this big office building that he has his headquarters in and he lets George have his casting sessions there. So George is bringing all these people and, but the place is kind of run down and, and Francis is like, I want to, I want to spruce it up. I want all the woodwork redone and everything right now. Meanwhile, Harrison is basically saying, Hey, give me a reading for this star Wars movie. And Fred goes to George and George's like, yeah, you know, I, I just, I had him in American graffiti. I don't think he's right for the, I don't nah, you know, no, nah, I don't want to, you know, so he can't get in. Right. He's not being interviewed to play this part. So. One day, Harrison gets a call from Fred saying, hey, I got a job for you. And he goes, is it the Star Wars? <laughs> you know, and he's like, he's like, no, not exactly. Because, you know, Harrison's a carpenter, but like sure. a master carpenter. Right. And he goes, um, you know, Francis needs his office building hallways, all the door moldings and the doors and everything and trim redone. Right. And Harrison's like, what the what what? Are you serious? And he goes, yeah, you know, hey, George is there. You might run into him. You know, and he goes and, he, and he's, he says, just do this. And he goes, oh, man. And so George is going to walk past me every day watching me being a carpenter. Great. Thanks a lot. Right. So but he needs the money. So he takes the job. So he and a couple of assistants are up there doing all this woodwork. And George keeps, you know, head down, walking past them every day for like a month. Right. And meanwhile, every time he's you know, in an in, in, in an interview with an actor, Harrison's out here going, "God damn it, hey, hand me that you spent, you know, hand me that wrench, hand me, you know, give me that saw, you know." And one day, and Fred, of course, is just sitting in his office giggling, right? And one day, and Harrison's doing what he's doing. Like this is Harrison's all on purpose. Doing his thing, being a carpenter and being pissed off that he's not getting into the room with George. And then one day, I guess George, somebody's leaving, and Harrison's out there having a fit at somebody about something, and he goes, "Ugh." And he knows right then and there what Fred has done. And he knows he's been set up, but he, but he's like, come here. And then Harrison goes and the rest is history. And every, that's incredible. Yeah. And every time Harrison gets an award for something, every time go through, go back. 
and watch him thank Fred Roos now, for, for the rest of his career. Because Fred, I mean, I, he didn't make Harrison. Harrison made himself. But but he, he, he very brilliantly, incisively, gorgeously, hysterically put him in exactly the place he needed to be for George to go, oh, duh. <laughs> that's one of the best stories I've ever heard on this podcast. Thanks. Patrick, that, that story is it's incredible. Fred and, 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 and Harrison's, I'm just repeating it, but, but it, it, it's a beautiful story and it's a true story. And, and I, and I, I think it's, I think it says so much about all three of them. That's so wonderful, you know, that Harrison was, was dedicated enough and, but also knew that he had to, you know, he had to pay his bills. And so he, he, he was willing to do the work to pay, you know, cause some people are like, I'm, that's beneath me. Sure. It wasn't, yeah. No, it was I'm beyond him. that. He loves woodworking. It wasn't that woodworking is beneath him. It's that he was worried that George was going to see him as just a carpenter and that that was kind of an embarrassing thing after him being a pretty cool part of American graffiti. Um, and, but Fred was way up. I mean, Fred was, and he is still one of the, probably one of the smartest guys in the business when it comes to, especially when it comes to people and how they relate. That's why he's such a great casting director and a great producer. So. Yeah, I mean, he, he's produced some of the most incredible films of all time. Yeah. And then Gary Kurtz goes without, saying i mean we all worshiped them and there's that argument it's a kind of a viable argument that star wars was never the same when gary stepped away from it um i what was your relationship with gary like what was that like i was fantastic i mean we were you know i, I we developed a lot of things together we talked about a lot of things we had a lot of there's still some projects we have that he's his name will still be on because he was part and parcel of you know making them work um you know he and i got along famously he would come visit I have to say, by the way, Lee, Lee Jones in Chicago, who is the, the 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 producer who really ran the show. I mean, Gary and Fred were my godfathers. They were they gave me access to actors. They gave me access to George. They well, I had already well, they introduced me to George. And um, I mean, he was your partner. Lee was your was in the trenches with you. Making yeah, Gary was, but but Lee was the one who 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 picked up something that looked impossible on paper. And somehow made it happen. I mean, when I first gave her the script and we met at a Starbucks in, I don't know, Skokie, Illinois or something, she she looked at me and she goes, you're crazy. She goes, you're absolutely crazy. Goes, you can't do this movie for this amount of money. And I said, I love a challenge. <laughs> you know, and I said, but Patrick, you, was, it the, I said, was it the number you quoted me earlier? Or? Yeah. Well, it was $120,000 on paper in the budget. And she said, she said, I, she goes, she goes, you're crazy. And I said, just crazy enough <laughs> i said the Geekscape is, i saw the movie here. yeah the movie got made but yeah. i'm still hearing you talk and thinking you're crazy <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and she was it was she was partially right only in that we didn't get all the money we needed we didn't get the 120 we got whatever eighty thousand or eighty five thousand. um but but there were people like uh my friend steve dahlbeck who was just the the father of my my kids best friends from preschool and everything who he and some of his buddies threw in a little money uh early on in the production just to help out and then when they found out we were short on finishing up some stuff in illinois because we'd run out of money he said because we were gonna have to shut down the film and lose this whole sequence we were shooting in this bowling alley and and he goes oh that's too bad and what you're you're what about ten thousand short and i said for today and you're gonna have to shut down and send everybody home and i said yeah and he goes well good luck man i'll see you later and right but half an hour before call time when we were going to have to basically shut the movie down, he walks in and he goes, Hey, um, hopefully this will help. And he hands me $10,000, which made us make payroll and gave us enough money to shoot the next few days. Um, and it was because people liked the movie and they liked the people. And they, it was a, I mean, it was a really, I, I hate to kumbaya it, but it was just a really nice energy and a really, People just were into the idea, you know? Um, and again, like it wasn't, like I said, nobody was waiting for the Patrick Reed Johnson story. It's not like everybody needed to see that. And the only reason I kept it me was for, you know, legal reasons and, 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 and truth reasons. Right. Um, uh, but I used to, for example, when I was directing, 
I never said, well, I would have done this or I this or that because I didn't treat the character as me. I treated the character as 17 year old Pat Johnson, who quantum mechanically is still back there living this adventure and would have no more connection to the me I am now that I mean he'd be he'd, if he dropped into my body he'd be like oh my god everything hurts and I hate myself <laughs> but John Francis Daly you had to give him space to have some ownership of the Completely. character as well or it's, you'd shut him down right and I didn't want everyone thinking I was walking around taking over their jobs because I was the authority mm -hmm. right like I mean the funny thing you is can't I, do that you can't come no. in and just start naming the blocking and no, like the no. beats you, you gotta it's all exploratory so that right. people can find it that's right. And John, to his credit, I mean, there was another very, very, very famous child actor who was going to play the part until about a week before production. Very famous child actor who is now in his teeth and elbows phase. And, and it would have been a perfect thing for him to do. And he agreed to do it. And then a week before production began, his parents called up and said, you know, we've decided we want 50 percent of the profits. His parents. Yeah. And I said, well, are you putting in 50 percent of the money? They're like, no. We just want 50% of the profits or he's not going to do the film. And I said, okay, I guess he's not doing the film. So now I'm a week out from shooting and I have no lead actor on a film that if it gets shut down, it's not going to start up again. And luckily, Cat White, my, <laughs> my extras casting director, I'm freaking out trying to figure out what to do because we've got to have some kind of a name, right? Yeah, you may not get up again. If you shut down now, you may right. not get up again. That's right. She says, what about John Francis Daly? And I said, Sam Weir? He's like eight. He's like nine years old. Of course. <laughs> You're thinking of freaks and geeks. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I, and she goes, that was 10 years ago. And I didn't, <laughs> my brain wasn't on straight. So I said, I, I mean, I don't. And so they sent me his headshot. And John would laugh at this because he, his hair, you see the hair that I have in the movie with the big, you know. Yeah kind of rock and roll 70s crazy mullety crazy thing um and john has what he calls his his jufro which <laughs> the is, hebrew <laughs> well he's got this you know tight curly hair and so i see him and i look at him and i go well it doesn't look really anything like me but he's got the right energy and it didn't really matter if he looked like me other than that he had to kind of match yeah my, my daughter and other and video and photos and i was kind of like I guess we could wig him. Now, the funny thing is, is that wig that he wears in the movie has not only been on him through the whole movie, but every other version of him in the movie, all the other people, the doubles, the, the different ages, the opening sequence, sure. movies, they all wear the exact same wig. It's not like a smaller wig on the nine-year-old. It's the same wig, you know? <laughs> I mean, the wig budget wasn't extensive on this one. No, but I even wore the wig when I was doing stunts with the Pinto. And my I unfortunately have a Charlie, I have a Charlie Brown head, okay? I have to get like special hats and helmets made for this goofy alien Martian head I have, right? So when I put the wig on, it, it looks like, you know, that that what what is that? That deputy dog, not deputy dog, but the, the Warner Brothers dog character that guards the sheep in in, in, in the movies. I'm sure. You know, I'm that big remember this. dog that's got the little puff of hair on the top of his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I look like in the wig, but at it least. Like, like like pinhead almost. Like, right. like a, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's it's kind of like one of the pinheads. Right. So anyway, but um, <laughs> yeah. I, so I, you right. lost this actor and uh, that was the second time you would have worked with Macaulay Culkin. Is that true? I'm oh, kidding. I'm was, not naming the team I, actor. I, I actually. <laughs> No, I never would have worked with Macaulay. I'm the one. I was. The well, let's talk about that because I only I read in that interview. Dennis the Menace. You were supposed to direct him in Dennis the Menace. No, I was supposed to direct Dennis the Menace. In fact, not only did I was I supposed to, I cast it. I got Walter Matthau and Joan Plowright, and I cast uh, Mason Gamble. And then a week out, John and I had a little discussion. John Hughes. The script, yeah, John John Hughes. Yeah, it's a long story. It's another night. Right, sure, sure, sure. Well, well, I mean, it sounds like you're perfect to come on Geekscape anytime you want. I, need, you, you, I mean, this is, uh, and so Dennis, the I had read in that, you know, the interview I'm talking about, it's pretty extensive. There was a great resource. You did the interview in, I think, 2014, and it said that you passed on Home Alone. Yes, I and did. Okay. That's and the reason point. I did, and, and look, I'm a big John, a huge John Hughes fan. I don't think you could have survived the 80s without being a big John Hughes fan. Well, right, and I, 
and John offered it to me. Um, well, first, actually, the funny thing is he offered me something called Reach the Rock, which is a film nobody's ever seen that did get made eventually, but it was a complete drama. It was, it was about, it was about a, a high school ne'er-do-well dude who had, who was in jail and it was the night of, of the, like the 20th reunion or something, or 10 year high school reunion. And his ex-girlfriend from his little town in the middle of Illinois in farm country, uh, who went off to New York and became a big lawyer, comes back to town for the reunion. And then she finds out that this guy's in jail and she comes to try to bail him out, but she can't get him out. So they have, they sit in this prison or in this sheriff's office and have a conversation all night long. It's all it is. It's just two people talking. It's like a My Dinner with Andre, but in It's like My Dinner prison. with Andre, written by John Hughes. And it is, it is, it was one of the most beautiful and interesting scripts I'd read ever. And John offered it to me as soon as this is got, after Space Invaders, before after Space Invaders. Invaders and, and I had just shown up at Universal and got my big three picture deal there, thanks to Steven. And um, because of Space Invaders, because of Space Invaders, which Steven saw and said, This has got to get picked up. We didn't have I love that they're pivoting you towards like dramas. I understand the kids' movies you come out of Space Invaders, I get yeah, that. No, but... I, and I, I never wanted to make kids' movies. The only reason I made Space Invaders is because it was an easy target. I could yeah. be goofy. I could use the low budget to my advantage. I could, you know what I mean. And I had but a, having worked with like Kenny Johnson, former Geekscape guest, Peter Himes, former Geekscape guest. Like Kenny's it, awesome. He does. Kenny is awesome. He is fantastic. And he, I love telling the stories from V. I love the Incredible Hulk stories. Like I tell, like well, anytime I see Lou Ferrigno at a convention, I'm like, dude, I was I'm friends with Kenny Johnson, and he's like, Kenny gave me my entire life, my entire uh, career. Kenny, a showrunner of Incredible Hulk. Kenny designed the did the original sculpt of the Martians that we were going to use for, for for when it was called Martians, and uh, and. I mean, no, he's. I mean, he did Alien Nation, which is a similar. And he you know, did V, which bro, I did. Yeah, I, I built awesome. authorship for V, the original it, in, the, in the miniseries, not the series, but the original miniseries. And who did I have on the? I had um, uh, help me, producer of Independence Day, Geek Sabers, sc screaming at me right now. Um, oh, uh, 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 um, <laughs> well, there's uh, the producer, um, partner of the director. Um, right. Uh, he absolutely went up to Kenny Johnson. The two of them. After right. after Independence Day comes out, came up to him and said, "Kenny, we owe you everything because that opening of Independence Day is absolutely V." And they cop to it and they thanked Kenny profusely yeah. about that. And you know what? I just completely realized that I had I, I had a brain freeze and I was thinking of Kenny Myers, the brilliant makeup effects guy. Right. I know Kenny Johnson. Because We're talking about Kenny Johnson because you worked on Kenny Myers was the makeup guy who did Lincoln and, you know, and he go, it goes all the way back to, yeah. No, but he's but, the guy who developed the, Kenny Myers developed the Martians. The alien for, for Martians. For, I, yeah, okay, I know. cool. They just had a similar dome to what Kenny Johnson <laughs> did in Alien Nation, which was running on TV a similar time that you were making, yeah. um, that you were making Space Invaders. Uh, you didn't do the, uh, Chris Columbus got, got home alone um you did baby's day is that true chris columbus yes. home so alone? I, I passed what happened was when i got this this script uh, for um reach the rock i thought there's nothing here for me because i'm i i still didn't know i was a pretty okay maybe possibly dramatic director i just knew that I could do things cheaper than a lot of people and I could do visual effects and I could, I could take a little money and make it look like a lot of money. And right? I still can with this 77. I, and I still want to. And that's where, that's my next trick, hopefully. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I was terrified of stepping into the realm of having none of those supports, none of those things to cling to. Cause this movie had none of that. This you movie, thought you needed like a gravitas right? or like some, you know, I thought I didn't have the gravity. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And I didn't know if I had the communication skills uh, with actors yet. Um, it's the same know. thing you were dealing with in your teens where people are like, you got it. And you're like, do I? <laughs> so I, so I passed, which you don't pass on John Hughes. He was pissed, but he was, but the way John Hughes deals with being angry or what he used to is to try to, you know, make up the stakes. So as soon as I passed on it, he offered me home alone. And I, I read it and I thought, this is hysterical. This is great. I'm the wrong guy for the job because I'm not really a comedy guy. <laughs> because you have I to take a gig sooner or later, Patrick. Yeah. Yeah, sooner or later, you're going to have to take one of these gigs. <laughs> but, but, 
but wait, so and and I also, but I also did know uh, that John was sort of looking for a pair of director shaped gloves um, that he could direct the movie through. Sure. Uh, not that Chris Columbus didn't do a great job, and it, and he's a terrific director, and he's a great guy, and he did a great job. But well, John, what had Chris Columbus oh, done before? Besides, right. he and wrote he Goonies, and then over Chris on that movie, he was all over him on Home Alone. I mean, John once said to me, after Chris had gone off and become Chris, you know, doing sure. his own thing, and you know, and they offered him Fantastic John, Four after that. John was pissed. He, John thought that Chris was going to just be his little acolyte for the rest of his life. And he said to me at one point, he goes, on Dennis, uh, he said, just you do this movie, get it done, and you're me. You're not going to be like Chris Columbus, who's now in the Chris Columbus business. And I, t- I thought, wow. Why, why would you do that? Why would you say that about I mean, this is a good guy. He did a great. You would want him to go off and be his own. Yeah, person. wouldn't you want to say, "I'm so proud of him. I, you know, I helped launch him." I, you know, did did Spielberg ever do that with Toby Hooper? Like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, you hear yeah. you hear the the stories about like Spielberg, like kind of ghost directing Poltergeist instead of he Toby Hooper. Like, I don't think Spielberg would have ever wanted that. No, he didn't ghost direct it. What he did was he was a really active and involved producer, rightly so. Monica. And creatively and toby directed it and steven was there as his partner um a good producer can do that there's nothing yeah. wrong with a with a with a powerful and interesting producer with great ideas being right next to you if you're willing to let your ego go and realize i mean if steven were next to me while i was directing a movie i wouldn't be like uh, excuse me i'm the director that's not it's not collaborative and like we said earlier with blocking actors and working with collaborative people like you got to give them space and well, including I, the people that are around I, you like I, the I, producers Spielberg, the, the, the space to create my god you would you would you would it, yeah how could you not ask for anything more interesting and educational and fun and i mean you know it Steve, would be hard not to recede to the point of creating a vacuum for him to feel uh, to, to fill like you would i would, I would I, feel so yeah you know I, I probably in my early days i would have occasionally fallen down on purpose just to see what he'd do <laughs> <laughs> let's see what steven does <laughs> so, so so when you hear this story that you were looking that he was looking for a director shaped pair of hands you didn't want to play that game i understand completely passing I, on home alone my father issues are you kidding and no this, yeah you, you yeah uh, there was i was not prepared in those early days because i was young and i was and i was used to making my own stuff and having control right and so when i was suddenly given opportunities to work with people like john or even with steven i mean there were things that steven offered me that i was terrified of because i didn't want to fail in front of yeah. him and i really didn't want to get into these issues of stop controlling me you know what i mean wow yeah I, no the daddy stuff i mean can you imagine we, we all we all have it patrick like you know I possibly i mean at the time i probably could have gotten into an argument with steven spielberg about anything but to what end, but yeah, to what yeah. end? only to like to defend myself against my dad i mean you know that was just i couldn't i was terrified of working for steven terrified sure and he Even though m- I was probably wasn't the he was probably very kind i just knew who i was and i sure. knew i knew that that when and and by the way everybody found out i mean i fought with everybody in hollywood i i fought, I fought with studio heads you know i was the emperor's new clothes kind of guy and it was all because i was you know i, I couldn't handle and didn't want to have to handle being handled or if you grow up in that household, the, those are the relationships you know, and you replicate them in order to create house. some kind of safe space for yourself. That's right. That's right. And I that caught, co- I mean, you look back and think that may have cost you several oh, things. Many, many. I mean, some that I literally just said no to r- straight up. Um, others that, that I couldn't get because by the time, I mean, there were, I mean, the list of films I passed on from 1990 to 1999, well, let's say more from 1990 to 1994 or five, um, because, you know, Baby's Doubt, when I, you know, John fired me off Dennis the Menace because I had notes on his script. 
So that no, just means- you're allowed to have notes on the script. Like I love John Hughes. He's a legend. His scripts yeah. are legendary. And my but- notes were really tiny and not like mm. revolutionary, but he called up, you know, our mutual agency CAA and said, we spent a night in his office going over the- what happened was I was out on a location scout. I get a call from John, come over tonight. We're only a week out of shooting and you haven't given me any notes. And I feel like, like you're holding back. Like you, you, you probably have to have some notes. Let's talk. Let's stay up all night. We'll watch, we'll watch stuff. We'll listen to music. Well, you know, so I come over and it's like 8 PM and we have dinner and we, or, you know, have a pizza or whatever. And we stay up all night till like it's four in the morning. And I start pitching him some ideas, creative ideas, you know, about things I, I think would be really fun for the film. And he's writing them down and he's on his little yellow pad and he's going, go on, go on, go on. This is great. This is fantastic. And I'm thinking, wow, I love this. You know, I mean, we're really vibing on this, right? And he goes, keep going. This is great. This is great stuff, right? So I go home at 4.30 in the morning. The next day I'm on another location scout and I get a call from my agent, Jay Maloney at CAA. And he goes, Patrick, what the fuck did you do? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, I hate this story. "Uh, I hate this story. He goes, you've just been fired. And I said, what and he goes yeah john called michael ovitz and said that you hate him and you think he's a hack and you you think he can't write and all this like i mean none of this happened of course none of it it was the the complete opposite right i saw right and and he goes so he's 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 dumping you and but it was a week out from shooting which meant i was pay or play vis-a-vis the dga and they go so we got a problem patrick um you're pay or play but he doesn't want to pay you and i said well huh, i'm sorry that's the way it works. and so he owes me three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, whatever you know and he goes well michael says you got two choices you can take the housekeeping deal with an office and an assistant over at warner brothers that bruce berman is offering who's another client of theirs you know uh and walk away and everything's fine. Or you can press the, the pay or play thing and never work again. Uh, and baby's day out came out of that. So that relationship you chose a year later, my wife, who's now at that point, my ex-wife, but, but, but sure. at that point, my wife is, I think eight months pregnant with oh, our God. first child. It's four in the morning. I haven't talked to John Hughes since. Right phone rings at 4 a.m. in the morning. It's John. Oh, well, I pick up, hello, I hear John. Would you have picked up if you knew it was him? Probably not. He, right. I, I, hear, I hear Johnson Hughes. And I went, what? And he goes, first question, do you hate me? And I said, John, no. It's more complicated than that. Yeah. And yeah, I said, I don't understand you. And he goes, okay, I fucked up. I fired the wrong person. You weren't the problem on Dennis the Menace, you know. Uh, but you know, I want to. I, I want to fix it. I want to. I got a. I got a project for us. And I said, John, you nearly destroyed my life. I'm pay and play. Right now on this film, or I'm hanging up, which means that he has to say yes. And when he does. Not only can he not fire me, in other words, I'm I'm getting the movie. You're can't. making the damn movie. Do you now, even know what the movie is? What, right. And he goes, yeah. and, and, and he's and I said, What is it? And he goes, Baby's Day Out. Now I had heard of this legendary script that was all about a baby crawling over a, all over a city and thinking to myself back in the day, shit, I'd love to do something like that. And shit, I'd hate to do something like that. It's like a, it's like it's like celebrating a silent movie. Like, like it's like Buster Keaton as a baby. <laughs> oh my god. And, and and the potential was incredible, and right. also the potential for complete disaster was, was was absolutely there. So he goes, "I want you to go over to my offices at Universe or at uh, Fox um, tomorrow and read the script." I said, "Okay, I'm pay and play. You I'm, and I'm, and I want to give notes, right? Well, here's <laughs> this is where it gets fun. So." I go to his offices at Fox where, by the way, I don't think he'd ever been to these offices. That was just another <laughs> perk he had. I don't know if he'd ever even been in these offices, but they were palatial in a huge building. His, his office itself was like something Mussolini would have you know, had, you know, <laughs> desk and big 
priceless paintings and all kinds of crap all of the and so the assistant in the in the, uh, the, the 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 sort of antechamber outside i come in and she goes hello mr johnson go on in the script is sitting on the desk go ahead and read it and then when you're done let me know right because they couldn't send the script out it was too secret right? so so i go in and i'm not allowed to close the door right and she can see me from her desk yeah right? if she turns over that's right so i sit at john's desk and there in front of me is a script and a yellow pad legal pad and a pencil and i just look down at it and i think <laughs> how clever and so i I take the desk drawer and I open it and it's empty. There's nothing in it. And I take the yellow pad. And meanwhile, this girl's looking over her shoulder, right? I take the yellow pad and the pencil and I put them in the drawer and I go and close it and read the script. And that was his form of an apology? I guess, but it was also a test. The right. test was, to, if I, I'm pretty sure that if, if I had even jotted down good <laughs> It would have been like he's got notes. Yeah, I, I just wasn't going to give him that ammunition. So, and then then I see her pick up her phone and dial, and she says, "You know." And so I just read the script, and I I look at it, and I go, "Holy shit, this is really difficult." But also, you know, throw me a challenge. Yeah. You know? Um. And so I, you know, I called him later, and I said, "It's great. I have no notes. Let's go." Wow. That was, that was it, and off we and went. And in, in, in Geekscape, is just look up the distribution story on that one because it, it had to open against True Lies and or this and that. It had to open against Lion King. Oh, oh wait. Oh, oh, let me comment on that. So, okay. We like, were, is, I was, did I get that right? It opened against Lion yes. King, but we were, obviously, we like against. James Cameron was the big fish over at Fox on that lot because, I mean, he helped build that lot oh, in, my during God, the 80s. Yeah. They owed him, they'll do anything for him. So, okay. So, we're supposed to come out in September of that year, right? Yeah, back to school, families, you know, about, ready to go. I think it was about March or April. We get a call saying, oh, you're coming out in July now, on July Ooh. 8th or whatever. And I was like, but that's 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 True Lies Day. And apparently Jim had called the studio and said, I'm not going to make July 8th. So, and they're like, we've booked you know, 15,000 theaters or whatever, you know, you know, we, 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 we don't have any, you can't. And he was like, I'm, I'm coming out and, you know, later in the year. And they're like, Oh yeah. So they call up Hughes and, and say, you're coming out in his spot, which meant we lost three, four months of post production. Yeah. Right. So post production on a VFX baby walking over, like, yeah. Uh, on girders movie. And get more, more effects than, not more effects than true lies, but not many fewer. Um, and so, so suddenly I've got that. Then of course it turns out that the same opening weekend is going to be, which we find out later is a uh, lion King. Right. So now I'm saying to Fox and everybody else, I'm saying, you don't really think you should take a kid's movie out against the lion King. Right. Yeah. So, Cause Disney's like working on all cylinders right well, there. Disney, kind of knows what they're doing so after like five years of hit after hit after hit as since the little mermaid yes so our opening weekend of course we're in the toilet and, and i get a call from a major 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 guy way the hell up in the in the hierarchy at, at fox and he goes dude i i don't know fuck who who knew i mean i said who knew I said, where were your kids this weekend? He goes, well, they went to see The Lion King, but they can see our movie anytime. I said, exactly. They went to see The Lion King. Of course they went to see The Lion King. Everyone in the world went to see I went to see The Lion King. Yeah, one of these had Happy Meal ramp up, uh, promotional right. ramp ups to it, and one of them didn't. And when you carve four months off of my ability to release the movie, you don't have Happy Meal ramp up time. You, you kind of need Happy Meal tie-ins to release a kid's movie in the summer. Right? A little bit. In fact... Patrick. This is a horror movie. Oh, oh, listen. This is why we might do a series based on 52577. Because my life after the end of my movie is so much more interesting and fun and crazy and insane. Well, than it's called life. Blumhouse. It's a horror movie. We got it. This is. It's called The Monolith. And it's, 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 <laughs> Mad, it's, it's Mad Men for the 1990s with all the names named. It, what, I, what I'd love to is that the next movie, Angus, 
again, like we started this conversation talking about the soundtrack, and that that Green Day song JAR is incredible, and I love it. Uh, is very close to the kind of movies John was making ten years earlier in high with the high school kids. That's right. And you, you kind of made your version of a John Hughes movie with Angus. Yeah. Um, this is the 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 tautological nature of your career is insane. Oh, and there's much more to it than we've talked Because there's a casting story at Angus, too, where you went into a Chicago area, Denny, uh, Wendy's, and see this, and you cast the, what's the story on casting the kid in Angus? This is a... Uh, I, I was, we had, we had searched all over the country. Charlie we, Talbot, is that the right name? Talbot? Talbot? Yeah, Charlie Talbot, who's acting his socks off right now. He's doing great stuff in lots That's of great. movies. Um, he, what happened was, casting directors all over the country were searching for, you know, heavy kids or quote unquote fat kids that could act. And I saw kids tapes from all over the country. And I went to, flew to New York and did auditions there and flew to, I was due to fly to Chicago and, and Chicago's where I'm from. So my parents, mm -hmm. I thought, you know, on the way back from New York, I'm just, def I'm going to take a couple of days and go see my folks and my siblings and friends and stuff. And as I was driving up from O'Hare Airport, they had these things over the 94 tollway there, these these oases or oases, I guess. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what the what is, what is these, plural they, oasis. Yeah, I don't know, but there were the, the, these there were these big tunnels of glass and steel over the freeway, over eight lanes of freeway. Yeah, and they'd have restaurants in restaurants them, and, and yeah, whatever. It was like a, it was a rest stop, you know, and. Um, so, you know, it was kind of a tradition to stop there on the way home from the airport and 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 get a burger or hang out. And it was like, I might have been one or two in the morning and I, I pulled in and there's a Wendy's and I go and there's this big line. And I'm thinking, why is there a line at 2 a.m., right? And there's all these people that are like checking their watches and looking around and I'm thinking maybe they're short people. And then I realize I, I look up front and there's like five or six workers and they're all gathered around a cash register laughing and giggling, mostly girls. And there's this heavy set guy like doing a like a comedy routine. He's just up there entertaining the shit out of these girls, right? And I kind of lean over and I, I kind of circle around and I watch him for a little bit, right? And he's just so cool and funny and charming, right? And finally he he like looks back and he goes, Oh man, I should probably stop. Okay, see you guys. And he turns around, and he starts walking past and I say, excuse me. And he goes, Yeah. And he's got a couple of friends with him. And I said, are you, are you interested in possibly being in a movie? And he looks at me like, looks me up and down. He goes, what kind of movie? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I said, wait. And I pulled out a card. I actually had a card for situations like this that said, you know, director and, and you know, New Line Cinema and the whole. I mean, it was like, I don't know. <laughs> that might have been sure. creepier. But I but said, don't just go to Chicago tomorrow to this casting director and put yourself on tape. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. And he goes, Oh, well, we'll see. Okay, man. Bye. Cut to, I get a call the next day from the casting director. who goes, this kid came in. You won't, you won't believe it. The kid you sent, she goes, that's it. It's done. And he'd never acted in his life. I love but he that story. lived the part. He had been in love since kindergarten with this girl in the high school who became a big deal and he was not popular and she was and and then got to dance with her at like the homecoming dance or something just when people were kind of changing out partners and that kind of stuff. And it was like his dream come true, you know, and he is yeah, Charlie's just a special human being and he did such a great job, especially for having never acted in his life. And he's up against three Oscar winners in that, mm -hmm. movie, you know. George C. Scott, Kathy Bates, Rita Moreno. Um, and they loved him, uh, even though they had to. I mean, George Scott was known. George was known to do two or three takes. And in the third take, you, if you didn't get it, you were on your own. Right. But right. he's working with a kid who needed 12 or 13 takes. George never complained because he knew the kid was trying, you know, and, and, and Charlie just nailed it. I mean, he just did such a good job in that film. That's an incredible story, and and you've discovered some people on that one. I mean, seeing like James Vanderbeek and Chris yep. Owen, who was big in uh, American Pie. Yep. And uh, it, it that's incredible. I that's really good luck discovering people. Ariana Richards, who I discovered in Space yep. Invaders, who Steve and then she ended up in Steve. Steven used her, saw her in Space Invaders, and put her in Jurassic Park. 
He was the first thing Steven said to me after me not having seen him or met him since 1977. I was walking into Amblin uh, across the courtyard in, in the facility at Amblin. And I was going to meet with Kathy Kennedy because they had gotten Jeffrey Katzenberg and, and, and Disney to pick up Space Invaders. And I was going to go have a kind of a development meeting with Kathy. And as I was walking across the court, Stephen comes walking out from the other door opposite me and comes and, and he goes right past me. And of course, he doesn't recognize me because it's you know 20 years later or whatever. And I'm and why would he? Um, but I'm thinking, what would my mom do? <laughs> yeah, she'd she'd hit me upside the head if I didn't turn around and go, hey, Stephen. Because you met Stephen in that original trip to Hollywood in the 70s. Right. Yeah. So I. He walks past. I'm walking. And I just whirl around and I say uh steven now you gotta understand a guy like steven has to be concerned about security at all times i mean yes like, so when somebody he doesn't know a stranger even in his own building addresses him by name you know i'm sure he's like reaching for his glock you know what i mean or he just keeps walking or he keeps walking. yeah you just keep walking pretend like, you didn't hear him he freezes in in his path he freezes and he stands there for like a second or two and i'm thinking oh shit i've i've either broken a rule or i've scared the hell out i don't know yeah and he slowly turns and looks at me he goes yes and i say it's pat, pat johnson pat, uh, space invader you pat, and he goes oh and he comes running over and he goes i love your movie it's so so cool and don't think i didn't see all the close encounters homages i saw them all and, I, and he's like just animated <laughs> you film nerds yeah Oh, and he's just nerding out with me. And finally, so he goes, that girl. He goes, where did you find? Who is this girl? She's amazing. He goes, where did you find her? And I, I said, you know, auditions, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I'm going to find something for her. I don't know what, but I'm going to find something for her. And I said, oh, you got to work with her. She's amazing. And and that was it. And off he went. And, you know, uh, the rest is history. She's and, he's like, would she know the Linux system? Is there a chance? <laughs> 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 Which she would. I mean, Ariana's the kind of person who actually would. So. I, I want to bring you back and talk about just Dragonheart because that's a movie I remember seeing it. Like, you know, Rob Cohen was firing all cylinders. Were you originally going to direct Dragonheart when you when you wrote it? Did you write it to kind of think about directing? Because Rob Cohen ended up doing it, and like, you oh, okay, uh -oh. you're getting a fa you're gonna look on your face like, oh. Fuck. So here's what happened. When I got picked up by Universal with my three picture deal, I started pitching ideas into the studio that I wanted to develop. And one of these ideas was Dragonheart, which was my idea, which I had written as, an, as, as a, a story. And they loved it. And Rafaela De Laurentiis wanted to be involved, right? And the, the, that was their studio for that stretch of like the eighties, nineties. Yeah, like I mean, Dino, Dino and her were yeah, she making were, they were a big all deal. sorts of stuff. Right. So I met with Raffaella. She loved the idea. She goes, do you want to write this? And I said, yeah. And I said, and she goes, and I said, and she goes, I don't have any money, but I own a hotel in Bora Bora. She goes, if you want to go down there, I'll send you and your writing partner, Scott Lawrence Alexander for two weeks, all expenses paid to Bora Bora to write the script. And I was like, deal. Sure. So she sends us down there and we're in Bora Bora. So yeah. he's off doing his thing. I'm off doing my thing and meeting people and having fun. And it was, and, and not writing. We didn't get, yeah, I was about to say, are you writing dragon heart there, Patrick? We got like 10 pages done and they were terrible. And the reason they were terrible was that even though I knew what I wanted this movie to be, I was writing it like a Monty Python film. I was trying, I was oh. going for jokes, going for jokes, going for jokes, which is not what I wanted it to no, be. No, that's dangerous as hell, too. What I really wanted it to be was Henry V with a dragon in it. I wanted, I mean, I had just seen Kenneth Branagh's Henry V, and I was like, I want a dragon movie that with this tone and this quality, right? And I, I really wanted it to have gravitas and have, you know, you know, and I thought, but I don't write. I, I can write the story. I know what the story is. I know what the dramatic beats are. I know what the sacrifices are. I know what it needs to be, but I don't write in this language. I don't write in this world without making it funny. Yeah. Right. Cause I'm not comfortable there. So our, our mutual manager, Melinda Jason introduced me to Chuck Pope and Chuck is steeped in this. He lives this, this is his world. I mean, his favorite movies, Robin hood, the original, you know, and, sure. uh, Actually, his favorite, I think, is uh, 
uh, Prince of Thieves, uh, or not oh. Prince of Thieves. Uh, well, now what's the uh, not the Errol Flynn one? The, 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 the one about Aladdin, um, or, or, or Arabian Nights? Uh, what, not, is it? No, it's who's the lead actor? I don't know. Not the co but not the Costner one. The Costner. No, one no, no. We're talking about recent. Yeah, Knights. we're talking earlier. Yeah. I don't know why I can't. Uh, it's not Prince of Thieves. What is it? No. That anyway. was the Costner one. Prince of Thieves is the Costner one. Yeah, maybe one. that's the one. But anyway, so Chuck and I vibed, and we totally. I could bring the story, you know, the the, and 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 I could help guide where I thought it needed to go in a visual sense, and where what I would do when it was done. And he had the language and the ability to really beat this thing out and make it work. And so sure. we worked together and worked together, and finally we turned in a script. And now, meanwhile. Rob Cohen is a friend of Raffaella's and he's often in her office when I'm in there talking about the pitch and about what we're doing and how things are going on the script. And right. The script goes in on a Friday and Monday morning we're greenlit. Wow. That's how good it is. Right. And now every actor in Hollywood of I mean, everybody, you, anybody who was famous and powerful in Hollywood wanted to be in this movie. Okay. We got Connery like that. Um, and then we got him because we had the same agent and Jay Maloney. One day I'm walking into CAA to have a meeting with him and he goes, Patrick, come here with me. I gotta, we gotta, before we have this meeting, I gotta take you down and introduce you to somebody. I'm like, Jay, I gotta do this meeting and go. I gotta get back to the studio. He goes, come with me. I said, no, Jay, I really got, he goes, and he opens the door to this conference room, shoves me in and slams the door behind me. And I turn around and there's this guy at a desk, bald headed guy with bifocals with a script. And he looks up and he goes, I very much like your script. <laughs> and i was like Gah! and he goes if you're willing to make it in spain i know just the people who can be the photographers you know the cinematographer i know the great ad the greatest ad in spain and and he goes and, and i live there so it's perfect you know and so we had this great conversation and he was in right mm -hmm. meanwhile universal's going what connery what I mean, it's kind of obvious. They're like, what about like somebody we have a deal with, like Whoopi Goldberg? What about Whoopi Goldberg is the voice of the dragon? I was like, mm. I love Whoopi. I know. But, but she's no dragon, you know? And and then, <laughs> I mean, it, everything went to hell. First of all, I had turned in a script they were never going to let me make because I had only done a $2 million sci-fi comedy that made a thousand percent of its money back, but they didn't, they were like, how do we get this to Tony Scott? How do we get this to Richard Donner? How do we get Stephen, Frank Marshall? And the head of the studio said, we don't. We wait for Patrick to find out how much it'll cost to make the movie and design everything. And then we fire him, you know? Mm. And so there was this whole, I mean, it just, I mean, there's an entire episode you could do on this movie. So, and, and we should, Patrick, I mean, because Rob Cohen then goes on to live at Universal oh. for quite some time. And he, I mean, he's the first director on the Fast and Furious movies. He obviously, before that, was doing the Scorpion King stuff. Well, you have to understand that he, so here's what happens they don't go to Rob for like another five years, right? Now, re, meanwhile, I've got Liam Neeson that I want to star as Bowen, right? And Liam and I are pals. And we're going out every night storyboarding the movie and designing costumes and he'd only just finished dark man right yeah dark man comes out and augers in doesn't make any money right head of universal says liam neeson's never going to amount to anything he's not going to be a star why do you want him i said because he is going to be a star you're going to be really sorry about this and you really ought to cast him because liam and sean connery going at yeah. each other you know taciturn liam sort of like this and sean absolutely you know that's this you know. and nothing against dennis quaid like we're all like, you know fine but he's yeah yeah you kind of expect him to pull a six shooter out and say you rascally dragon i mean it's not yeah. like, all these it, it, he's not playing that the, it's the one role that he's doing where it's like you're kind of uh cast out of it you're not really yeah i mean they sent it to tom hanks and i got furious with the studio i said why would you do this first of all tom will probably like the script but then he's going to call up and say are you people fucking crazy yeah i'm not that guy and and i said and that's going to make me look like an idiot like i was the one who said send it to you know tom hanks which i didn't you know i love tom hanks but no you yeah. know but so then anyway eventually what happened so meanwhile so I, I'm, I'm just setting up that rob cohen knows full well who created the project right so Finally, when Tom Hanks passes and a couple other actors that they want 
because I had Timothy Dalton coming in. I had uh, Pierce Brosnan. I had all these people coming in who wanted to do it. But the studio was like, no, no, no. They wanted, like at one point they wanted Arnold to play the night. I love Arnold. But I said, look, this movie is really dialogue heavy. <laughs> Did they end up getting him on end of days? I, yeah, right. And yeah, I, it's, it, like, it just, yeah. it's nothing. So, <laughs> so finally they said, well, who do you want to be? And I said, I want Liam. And if it's not Liam, I'm not doing it. And they said, really? And I said, yeah. And they said, okay, bye. Fuck. And they literally pay or played me in the room. They said, we'll write you a check. And I said, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. And they said, no, you said it. I, that, and they pay or played me off my own project, right? So that was it. And I'll tell you a story about what Liam did about that years later when they went back to him after he was a superstar. And, and he was the most stand-up guy in Hollywood. It's a great story. Um, but but one day after the film goes into production or actually it's almost finished, I, I'm reading like not Starlog, but some magazine like that. Right. And there's this big interview with with Rob Cohen where he says, yeah, this was a great script that I'd been following, that it had been developed by Raffaella. And, you know, and, and somehow this film student, Patrick Reed Johnson, got attached for a while. He said that in print. And it was like, OK you are an asshole <laughs> rob you're an asshole i've heard stories none of them have been on geekscape but uh you hear things living in hollywood, you could have just in said, hollywood. oh you know it wasn't the right time for patrick he wasn't you know the studio was a little yes. worried i yes. had experience diplomatic ways to do it and then he there's the ways i and i would have honored that i would have been fine with that but instead he tried to like say that somehow i magically got attached to a project that I didn't have anything to do with, which was just ridiculous. So, well, uh, Patrick, um, first question: When are you coming back? Uh, <laughs> we, have, we, we have to exchange. We have to exchange yeah. information because oh yeah, you got to come back. Emma, send me everything, or just find we, me at Facebook. We will. Um, I'm gonna find you on Facebook, and, and we'll sh we'll yeah we'll, sh we'll like follow each other on Instagrams and stuff. Guys, the movie, again, we got to go back to the original. If you want to hear, if you actually want to see some of these stories play out in real life, mm -hmm. the movie is called 52577. It's going to be, go ahead and go on Amazon right now and pre order it. The Please. movie has, it's, it's, it's a ton of stories like this, but the teen version. <laughs> and if you make it a hit on Amazon, uh, I know you got to deal with Showtime a little later. Like, we're, we'll make a, we'll, we'll do the series of the 90s. Because this all, this is, Patrick, this is insane. Yeah. And but you know it's insane. And this is, we've skimmed the surface. I know. I so. know. This is incredible. Uh, we're going to exchange information, and we'll get you back here on Geekscape, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm excited. And uh, let me know when it's going to air. Right, well, I'm going to put it up as soon as I uh, record the bookends, the intro uh, and the outro, yeah. and I'll throw it up on the uh, podcast network. Uh, Geekscape, as you know where to find us. Just search for Geekscape, you'll find us. Um, Patrick, thanks for coming on, man. No problem. I look forward to coming back. <laughs> All right.